drugs, and particularly several types of drugs. Uh, drugs uh, induce, inducing uh, chronic hepatotoxicity, um, potentially an immune mediated hepatotoxicity, um, and so forth. Well, what can you recommend to, to, uh, to have access to this? Uh, the, the FP a partner consortium that's forming is going to make those drugs available. We are forming at the moment, but uh, we, we will have a project that will be running hopefully by this time next year. That's our intention. And one of the first things we want to do is have a shopping list of appropriate compounds and a physical repository of appropriate reference compounds that we evaluated. So is it fair to say, Richard, that this is one of the things we'll, we'll take away from today and have a chat about and see how we can translate this into a quick win when the project forms? Uh, yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Is this working? Yeah, I think so. Well, if not, oh, OK. You can hear me. Um, what Jerry said is extremely important. Um, in terms of making a success, it is the radical rethinking approach of what we're going to do here in terms of coming together in terms of the academia and industry. Um, just picking up on the point in terms of the compounds, it's our belief that it is absolutely pivotal to make these compounds available. Why is that? If we look into the marketed compounds that we know have uh, drug liver injury, they're old compounds. In recent years, 10 years, the chemistry of these compounds has changed, and we need to be considering also, to, if we're thinking outside the box, the chemistry's changed, has the approach in terms of the DILI also changed? Are the mechanisms different? So we need to be looking at recent candidates as well as marketed compounds. Yeah. We will clearly have a discussion of to what extent delivery of compounds becomes side ground versus foreground. It sounds to me already like it could be a side ground issue because we would not want to accidentally restrict uh, the ability of people to innovate by restricting compound supply as foreground deliverable in this project. But it, it's certainly something that will be within the scope of what we discuss. You have the microphone. <laughs> we have several models. Fibroblast. Um, one point: Is it strictly necessary uh, to uh, to build a consortium to um, to have all the models available, particularly in vitro in vivo models? I think that's a very good question. Uh, I don't know. I, I would hope that the academic consortia, which will form and prepare bids will be considering that right up front. Uh, I don't know what the answer is at the moment. I'm looking forward to hearing what the proposals are for the academic consortium. Richard, have you got a, a personal perspective on this at the moment? I don't need to say that I uh, share your opinion on that one. Okay. Anybody That's else? A up the back. Hi. Oh, that's a bit loud. <laughs> David Hay, University of Edinburgh. Um, I think in this programme of work, there's going to have to be a focus on cost. So you, it, is pharma going to be looking at something that's deliverable, it's scalable, and you can produce it for something like $20 a plate? Ah, very good, very good question. Richard, do you want to start with that one? <laughs> I, well, I think that's where you kind of move from, if you like, the academic arena into your large-scale manufacture? Sure. Sure. I, I guess that would be the ideal goal for the SMEs in terms of uh, providing kits in the future. I think, as Jerry's quite clearly pointed out, uh, a five-year time frame is sufficiently not enough to both look and evaluate the existing models, to um, assess these with the compounds available, looking at new models, and then at the same time, you know, in terms of actually looking at these as qualified kits um, for uh, DILI assessment. So I, I think, indeed, I think as you said, Jerry, that uh, you'd be lucky, you'd be getting some kind of output by the end of this five-year period with some 
of the validation of existing kits. Right, can I try to tackle this in a different fashion? Because rather than directly address your question, which I think is a really good one, the other way of perceiving it is, what's the cost to a company of taking forward a molecule that's going to fail in a regulatory 28-day study? And a regulatory 28-day study is going to cost us, what, $100,000, something like that, to run in, in rodents, you know, higher in non-rodent. Phase one clinical trial, we're getting up to a million or so. Phase two clinical trial, tens of millions. Phase three, hundreds of millions. So when you factor the cost in of taking the wrong molecule forward and then think of what we're trying to do here is build a test cascade. And some of the approaches will be coarse tea strainers and an obviously stupid molecule that, that really lights up in any in vitro assay could be picked up with a relatively crude in vitro assay. I'll say one example that, that we've seen that would fit all those criteria would, would be triglitazone. I am amazed that triglitazone is not toxic in vivo in preclinical safety species or normal people because it's so toxic in cell-based systems. So you don't need a sophisticated assay to uh, clean up a molecule like that. Other endpoints, particularly maybe fibrotic endpoints, more sophisticated um, endpoints like Im immune assays, you'll need more sophisticated models. So you could have very cheap, uh, low-cost, $10 a plate or less approaches as tea strainers and really quite complicated, high-quality models that are used to pick up a molecule before we waste serious money on it. And if 100,000 is what uh, a repeat dose regulatory study is going to cost, we'd be interested in modest cost assays that we could apply to a short list before we select the candidate for going into, into clinical question. Does that help? It's, it's not an answer to your question, but it's an attempt to try and put it into context. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I, I kind of see coming from the stem cell perspective and working with human ES cells and induced pluripotent cells, producing models that pick up rogue candidates much earlier in the process and, as you say, go for a much more sophisticated approach as you're approaching preclinical testing yeah. of these candidates. Yeah, absolutely. And, and stem cells potentially have a unique opportunity to, to plug into a variety of model systems. I think also with the idiosyncratic modeling as well. I mean, you can, take a, you can take an induced pluripotent stem cell from someone who's presented with penicillin, uh, idiosyncratic reaction. And now you're getting innovative, and I, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Kevin, did you have uh, something? Uh, over there. So um, one of the important things is to be forward-looking, and so this will run from 2011 to 2016. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the landscape of drugs is changing. Mm. So would biopharmaceuticals come into this? Yes. We, we have a, a, a substantial biotechnology sector, and just recently I've been approached by them about a number of projects where they've had liver signals in their preclinical evaluation. So biopharmaceuticals for me are definitely within scope. Okay. The second point was sort of one of clarification. We heard this morning that mechanisms were essential. And, and I take your point about the, what those that are, if you call them, type A. So th there's a point about reducing the unnecessary use of animals and to actually uh, have better prediction in animal models. But that might be a slightly different question from predicting certainly idiosyncratic in, uh, actions in man. Uh, and you said earlier that you were interested in really telling the chemist rather than the clinician what to do. That was the purpose of this call. But just following on from the last question, uh, if you take flucloxacillin, every penicillin covalently binds in every patient. That's a fight. So that's, the chemist knows that. But the idea of having the pluripotent stem cells and bringing that in. So in terms of understanding the mechanisms, um, can I assume you're not, assume, not excluding clinical work, that we need to start in man at least a part of the consortium to actually get back to understand the full picture of the mechanism or not? Oh, I, I fully agree that this work cannot be divorced from mechanisms and cannot be divorced from other activities, particularly getting across the human dimension. What we were strongly encouraged to do within this call was be specific about the unique and targeted work we want this call to focus on, but we very much hope that this call will link up and overlap with related work that other people are doing. 
we couldn't find a way to get FPA partners to bring in the clinical element in the time we had available because just it's the way that companies operate. We wouldn't have been able to get a consolidated clinical view of what a, a clinical program could look like within FPA partners for drug-induced liver injury that could have been brought into play. And we've already got the clinical biomarker safe t call which is in the liver domain, and we've got the Serious Adverse Event Consortium, we've got Predictive Safety Testing Consortium, we've got Dillon, we've got all the networks who are making a start at the clinical side of things. So we spotted that the, the whole, for us, felt like the preclinical arena, and we said for this call, that's where we need to be specific, plug in that hole. But no, you're absolutely right, we are not looking to create artificial boundaries. I very much hope and anticipate that the new scientific understanding will tremendously advance our understanding of mechanisms. It's really only when we have the new creative model systems we'll understand how important reactive metabolites truly are for idiosyncrasy. You know, for many cases at the moment, we simply don't know. And I'm hoping that the new model systems will give us better scientific understanding, enable us to generate and test hypotheses as we go along. And we will want to translate up and we'll want to build bridges, particularly with the biomarker people and looking at, at other susceptibility factors. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Nico. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, indeed, the use of, 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 of data from others and not incorporating or investigating everything yourself, but use as far as possible data from others as well, including, of course, the FBI. But is, it, is there in this context an IMI policy that um, you're basically using also data which are produced uh, in other IMI projects? You mentioned... Uh, safety, for example, yeah. or in silico talks, or is there is there a policy? And we'll start this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try to address this question. Um, yes, uh, you're right. There is not uh, an IMI policy that allows uh, automatically projects to work with one another. However, what we're saying right now and what is becoming. Uh, more and more clear is that the projects need to foresee that they can work with other projects within the EME programs or even uh, international programs so that they don't exclude themselves from those co collaborations um, as well. If, for example, they see that they found something really interesting and uh, that needs to go uh, to man, then um, we this need definitely needs to be investigated and needs to be thought of while you are writing the project agreement. Richard, Does you're, that help? Richard you're directly involved in other IMI-related work, aren't you? Well, yes, in terms of the company, yes, absolutely. Yes. Etox is uh, a good example. Um, and there, the um, aim is the collection of in vivo data, non-clinical data, to build a database <coughs> and from that database to then look towards building in silica models for some predictive element of toxicity. So it's got both the structural element to it and the uh, defining characteristics of the toxicity. Um, so we wouldn't see uh, this um, call being in isolation, but very much complementary to these other activities um, and learning from each other. Yes, we, we were encouraged to be very clear when we were putting the call together and, and seeking support from the Commission and, and from IMI to identify the distinctive nature of this call, but also to bear in mind, once we'd made clear the distinctive nature of this call, don't forget the opportunities for, for building bridges. Yeah. So, yeah, if that's not been implicit, you know, thanks for putting that out, Nico. Yeah. 